First Unitarian Denver, just a, just a brief note about what we're up to this morning. I want to thank Alton Dillard for the suggestion of this particular topic, and I especially want to thank him for saying yes when I asked him to share his own thoughts on this particular subject. You're going to hear those in just a moment. But I want to just say a word about why we're dealing with this subject of toxic masculinity and male violence. Um, and that is because we are a faith tradition that believes we should always have our doors open. That is, our, our, our congregational walls should be transparent so that what is happening on the inside is obvious to all on the outside. And what's happening on the outside is a part of our own spiritual life and spiritual growth and spiritual development. We don't think we should hide our spirituality away in the locked, room, locked walls of a church, but our spirituality has to live and grow and breathe in the larger community, the larger culture in which we live. And that's why we're going to be talking about this today. So I just wanted to say that um, in preparation. Um, and uh, I, I'm really glad you're with us today. At a recent virtual coffee hour, I was unpacking everything from mass shootings to police shootings with a couple of gentlemen from our congregation. After the Boulder shooting, I had cautioned everyone not to jump to any racial conclusions. I saw a lot of social media traffic essentially saying, well, another crazy white guy with a gun. That turned out not to be the case. The shooter was a fat, balding 21-year-old Syrian. The Columbine, Aurora Theater, Sandy Hook, and Charleston Church shooters were white, but the D.C. snipers, the Navy Yard shooters, they were black. The Fort Hood shooter was an American of Palestinian descent. The Pulse nightclub shooter was an American of Afghani descent. The Virginia Tech shooter was Korean. The discussion took a turn as we talked about the common thread of these mass shooters being that they are all male. The turn was towards the topic of police shootings and use of force, but don't forget women officers were involved in the Dante Wright shooting and also posed for pictures where Elijah McClain was murdered, and they were also involved in the violent takedown of a 73-year-old woman with dementia. Now, maybe the takedown of a 73-year-old white woman with dementia along with the Chauvin conviction will finally spur some change in policing, but that's a topic for another time. As our little breakout group began to posit, we started asking the question, are mass shooters and rogue cops just examples of toxic masculinity run out to the nth degree? Think about it. Have you ever seen a woman behind the wheel of a surplus Crown Victoria tricked out with light bars being pulled over for being a suspected police impersonator? In the discussion with my fellow parishioners, I brought up a topic that I'm engaging with people on social media about. Why do men lose our minds when things don't go our way? I'd been thinking about this ever since the white guy up north killed his wife and put his daughters in an oil well. As soon as I heard that he was struggling financially and had another mouth to feed on the way, I knew he was guilty. Not all men can deal with financial hardship. There was also a recent case in another state where a black man killed an entire family because the woman wouldn't give him a cut of her stimulus check. James Holmes, the Aurora Theater shooter. First world problem, he was flunking out of a PhD program in neuroscience. The Isla Vista shooter couldn't get dates. Someone has to die. I was raised by strong women who made sure I knew enough about life to know that landings were not always going to be soft. It was also a household where everyone pitched in to keep things going. Everyone did yard work, housework, cooking, etc. There were no men's chores or women's chores. There were chores. It was a nurturing household. However, I do have a vivid childhood memory of giving my mom a quick walk-by hug when she was playing cards with other adults in the backyard of a nearby home. One of the other moms said, You let your son be affectionate with you? Pardon the term, this was about 1970. But she said, He's going to grow up to be a sissy. I never made more than five bucks an hour until I was 30 years old, and I will confess to two things. In my 20s, I shot the window out of my lemon of a car with a BB gun in frustration because it had stranded me once again. And another time I did sort of have a Louisville slugger dangling by my leg when I was inquiring about my pay after I'd been stiffed by a business owner. Two of the dumbest decisions I've ever made, but I learned from both of them. 
Fast forward to the present and the threshold question. Why do we as men lose it the way we do? What does it even mean to be a man? Are we so conditioned from our caveman origins that we feel the stress of being the hunter and gatherer? Or is it the Victorian construct that we are less of a man if we are not a good provider? Or is it because we are made to feel less of a man if we shed a tear or acknowledge hurt feelings or feelings in general? I've always been blessed with the type of male friendships where we're able to openly discuss everything from our health to our successes to our failures. But even my circle hasn't been immune. I lost a dear friend who had occasionally joined me at church to suicide a few years ago when he grew tired of fighting his mental health demons. My group of friends also gathered en masse to have a frank conversation after another one of our friends committed murder-suicide after a carefully curated house of cards came crashing down due to a bad business deal. No longer afford the big old house, no longer can afford the fancy cars. In just a couple of days since I've been trying to pull these thoughts together, a boyfriend killed six people at a birthday party because he wasn't invited down in Colorado Springs. Dozens of schoolgirls were killed in a blast in Afghanistan by radical theists who don't believe that girls should get educations. This is a call out to men. Who's that guy you can talk to when you're struggling? Who's the guy you can talk to about sensitive health matters, whether they be physical or mental? Who's that guy you can talk to when you're feeling professional pressure? Have you ever called out toxic masculinity when you've seen it? Now, I understand my words contain mostly questions, no answers, but it is incumbent upon us to ask questions about our maleness and if it somehow manifests itself in toxic masculinity. It's important to make sure that we, before we snap, before we get angry, to take that deep breath. To quote the great Theo Wilson, hurt people hurt people. Again, thank you, Alton, for sharing your thoughts. The statistics are undeniable. 91% of all murderers are men. 97% of mass shooters are men. And this should be part of any discussion about violence, too. Statistics show that while race is undeniably a factor in arrests and convictions and sentencing, there is no evidence that white men are statistically more likely to be a mass shooter. It's about 62%, which is almost perfectly aligns with the percentage of white men in America when compared to men who are black, Hispanic, Asian, Middle Eastern, or indigenous. In other words, the rates are about the same. There's many theories about why mass shooters are overwhelmingly male, some of which are silly and unsupportable, and some of which are supported by some psychological data. Turns out men are much more likely to identify the source of their problems outside of themselves. So when they're feeling oppressed, hurt, betrayed, devalued, men tend to blame someone or something else. Women, on the other hand, when they're feeling oppressed, hurt, betrayed, or devalued, tend to blame themselves, which of course can be equally unhealthy. And none of this is hard and fast, right? Gender is endlessly fluid and there's endless exceptions, but this is what current research shows. It's also true statistically that unlike men, when women do become murderous, Guns are usually not their weapon of choice. The phrase toxic masculinity came out of the men's movement in the 1980s and 90s and was quickly adopted by academics in psychology and sociology. And there's a lot of theories and definitions which we can summarize and simplify uh, with three core components that most researchers agree on make up toxic masculinity. First, placing an unusual, maybe pathological value on toughness. This notion that men are supposed to be physically strong, emotionally callous, and behaviorally aggressive. Second, dismissal of femininity and all things feminine. 
This idea that men need to reject anything that might possibly be considered feminine. That's gestures, affects, language, of course, but also showing emotion or accepting help or even being aware of other people's emotions or of even offering help. Out of anti-femininity comes the attendant homo and transphobia, so characteristic of toxic masculinity. And third, revolves around power and this assumption that men must work towards obtaining power and status over others, physical, social, financial, or otherwise, and that's what makes you a man. These things lead, so the research says, to a glorification of unhealthy habits. No self-care, toughen it out, not seeing doctors, not seeking mental health help, not taking needed medications. Leads to avoiding feelings, especially to not talking about feelings. Leads to what might be called the opposite of emotional intelligence, not even being able to recognize, let alone cope with difficult emotions like anger, depression, disappointment, loneliness, or grief. Leads to being unwilling or unable to exhibit helping behavior when someone else is feeling anger, depression, disappointment, loneliness, or grief. And even being unwilling to call for help when someone else is desperately in need of it. We know that statistically the single largest predictor of whether an individual will grow up to perpetrate, perpetrate violence is whether they were exposed to violence as a child. We know that the second most reliable predictor of violence is poverty, especially if it occurs amid examples of great wealth. And the third most reliable predictor of violence is high rates of unemployment, all of which are interrelated and exacerbated by American culture. In Jeffrey Canada's magnificent book, Fist, Stick, Knife, Gun, he writes, and I quote, America has, a long, has long had a love affair with violence and guns. It's our history. We teach it to all of our young. The revolution, the taming of the West, the Civil War, the World Wars, and on and on. Guns, justice, righteousness, freedom, liberty, all tied to violence. And even when we teach about nonviolence, we tend to use the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. killed by violence. I'm sorry, America, but once you get past the rhetoric, what we really learn is that might does make right. So some of the best thinking on this subject that I've come across, or I should say at least in my opinion and experience, comes from Reverend Dr. Rebecca Parker, a Unitarian Universalist minister, teacher, and theologian who believes that we really have to move on from thinking that simple nonviolence will save us. And she suggests not a solution, but a foundation from which to move towards a solution in three parts. First, she says we must all make a deep commitment to make decisions from first-hand experience. That is, let go of the myths, the rhetoric, and the blaming. She maintains that all of us, all of us have deep personal knowledge of violence that we rarely raise to consciousness. We have fought in wars, or we have fathers, brothers, sisters, or close friends who have fought in wars. All of us carry the deep spiritual wounds of war that affect families for generations. We have lived in the violence of poverty, or we have mothers, sisters, or close friends who have lived in the violence of poverty. We have lived under violent systemic racism, or we have families, children, grandparents, or close friends who have lived under violent systemic racism. We live in fear of violence or the violence of poverty, fear of being homeless, of children without health care, of racist, sexist, classist systems that threaten our bodies, on and on. These are powerful and personal realities that are all around us, and we must not shy away from them, she says. Violent systems, she maintains, retain their power through a cloak of silence. 
We must break the silence, tap into our own experience and knowledge of these things, speak out, give names to these realities and our own depth experience. Second, she suggests that we have to take responsibility. And this is hard, but it's true. Our lives participate in systems that maintain violence, whether it's white privilege, holding back our moral voices on issues of importance or failing to adequately participate in our own democracy. We can't hold others accountable unless we're willing to be accountable ourselves and we are all complicit at some level. Third, Parker says, we should always ask, who benefits? Who benefits from violence? Who and what is being served? Where is the money flowing when it comes to systems of power, the availability of guns, mass incarceration, misogyny, racism, and so on? These are truths that need to be spoken, questions that need to be asked. On a deeper, more personal level, how, how deep is our cultural brokenness? Our separation and our fear of each other? What is this pressure we feel, and we all feel it, to be disconnected from our own communities, suspicious of our brothers and sisters, our fellow travelers on this great journey through life and into the unknown future. What is it that keeps us fearful of intimacy, untrusting, divided instead of united? What does this particular cultural system serve? Like, can we name that? Can we, can we find a language to chase this out of the darkness and into the light? Do we have that kind of courage? Do we have that kind of resolve? I don't know the answer. Not exactly. Like Alton said, more questions than answers. But I know this much. I know that I can't do this alone. And I don't think you can either. Amen.